Wow, here we are. Chatting Hello. away on the internet. <laughs> it has begun. Hello, thank you for joining us today for a live hangout with Lucy Bellwood, adventure cartoonist and previous Schmidt Ocean Institute artist at sea. My name is Logan Mock Bunning, and I am the outreach specialist for Schmidt Ocean Institute. We're excited to be joined by people from all over the globe as we talk about science and art, as well as living and working on research vessel Falkor during a mapping expedition. Before we get started today, a little bit of housekeeping. We love participation from all of you watching. Please ask questions. You can ask questions on the YouTube chat bar on the right of your screen, or send tweets with the handle at Schmidt Ocean, or hashtag artist at sea. Please go ahead and post questions at any point in this Hangout. We will be answering questions during a few spots in the Hangout, and we've also set, a time, uh, at the, we've set aside time at the end for additional Q&A. For those of you who are not familiar with Schmidt Ocean Institute, a quick introduction. We're a nonprofit that was established in 2009. We strive to advance the frontiers of ocean research and exploration through technological innovation, operational support, and open sharing of information. One of the ways that SOI seeks to raise awareness and inspire people is through our outreach programs like Artists at Sea. Like scientists, artists conceptualize and put together ideas in new ways. Every year we have an open call for artists across the globe to apply for berths of opportunity to sail on Falkor with the Science Party, not only to participate in the research being conducted, but to also share about the work being done through their art. In January, adventure cartoonist Lucy Bellwood joined the Eyes Below the Surface Mapping Johnson Atoll expedition and created a comic about mapping the deep ocean in her time on board. I am pleased to introduce our guest of honor, Lucy Bellwood. Hello. Hey. Hi, Logan. Hi, Internet. <laughs> Can you start off, Lucy, by telling us a little bit about yourself and how you came into doing comics? Yeah, boy, big question. Uh, so I... I, I am, call myself a professional adventure cartoonist, which is a made-up job title, discerning viewers will note. Uh, I've been drawing comics full-time for the last five years and off and on since 2010. Uh, so this is my full-time job. And I specialize in making comics about nonfiction stuff generally, a lot of it to do with my background as a tall ship sailor. So I have a lot of maritime history interest in my work, but I'd never really branched out into science prior to core for the uh, expedition that I participated in earlier this year. So that was a really exciting shift for me. And I came into comics in a roundabout way, and I've talked a lot about it in other places, so I won't spend too long gabbing about it, but uh, I don't have an official comics degree. There are more of those these days than there used to be, but I think the best way to become a cartoonist is to make lots of comics and hang out with other people who make comics and continue to talk about and think about how best to make comics and find mentors, not necessarily to go to like the best top in the world. <laughs> it's a question I get a lot and everyone's always like, oh, did you go to school for this? And it's like, well, yes and no, I do have an art degree, but it's from a liberal arts college where they make you like read Thucydides your freshman year. So I parse that in a way that makes sense from a traditional educational standpoint. I'm trying to think if there's other germane details. I live in Portland, Oregon uh, most of the time when I'm not venture cartoonisting out in the world. And uh, I also do comic stuff for uh, The Nib, which is a nonfiction comics journalism outlet online. Folks may have seen my stuff there. I've also published a couple of books through Kickstarter. So I do a lot of like independent self-driven stuff. And I'm part of a collective here in Portland called Helioscope, which is I believe the largest collective of freelance comics professionals in North America. Uh, so there's probably about 28 of us who share an office here in town. And uh, we all work together and support one another and uh, get really jealous and excited when our members go off and do things like crossing the Pacific on a research vessel. Um, can you tell us a little bit maybe about uh, your seagoing experience as well? Because this was not the first time that you were on a ship. Absolutely not, no. Uh, so when I was 16, I shipped out aboard the Lady Washington, a uh, reenactment historical replica vessel based on the west coast of the US. And she came through uh, the port that's closest to my hometown of Ojai, California in Ventura every January. And every January there would be a little article in the newspaper and my parents would say, oh, do you want to go do that? And I'd say, yeah, that sounds kind of cool. And then when I was in high school and I was seized by like full pirate mania, I guess middle school, high school, uh, the, the strong to ignore. And we went out for a, a three hour sail and I was completely hooked and immediately wanted to find out how I could volunteer, when I could leave school forever and go crew on a tall ship permanently. And 
uh, my parents were indulgent enough to let me go off for my spring break of my senior year and crew on board and get my volunteer certification. And then I continued going back over the next couple of years and volunteering as a deckhand and assisting a little bit with stewarding. So like interacting with passengers and uh, teaching a lot of school kids and then all of the other exciting tasks like scrambling around in the rigging and furling sails and shouting a lot and uh, eating far better food than sailors in the 1700s would have consumed, which is a blessing of modern uh, maritime life, especially on Falcor, good Lord. But Lady doesn't do nearly as many open ocean transits. She's very much a near coastal, uh, up and down the Western half of the country kind of vessel. So most of the time we're not at sea for extended periods of time in the way that Falcor is, which is a blessing from the culinary side of things. So this was the first time that you'd done anything uh, in regards to mapping, correct? Yeah, absolutely. I had never had any experience with uh, multi-beam sonar or any of the ship's equipment or like been on board a vessel of that kind of scientific caliber. So what was the learning process? It was a lot of being willing to ask stupid questions uh, <laughs> and look like a fool, which is good because I am kind of a human Muppet. That's like part of my brand, I think, is that I wave my arms a lot and I'm willing to be a goofball. And that has been good preparation for being thrown into an environment with uh, many, many experienced, intelligent people who I had to pester over and over again for details that I wanted to put in my comic and I wanted to make sure that I didn't get them wrong. Because with tall ship stuff, I'm the expert, so I talk to myself and make sure, I mean, if, if there's something I need guidance on, I'll run a page by somebody else, but most of the time I'm checking my own work. And with this comic, it was really a collaborative effort because I was reliant on not only being briefed on how to stand mapping watches so that I could participate in the process and be helpful to the science team, but also in checking and double and triple checking my work to make sure, and even then, to just kind of gloss over like the comic almost went to print with the wrong number of beams in the multi-beam system. I transposed two numbers and uh, nobody noticed until the last minute. So it was a little, <laughs> a little hair raising, a little dicey. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was lots of asking questions and lots of taking notes and trying to strike a sweet balance between the wealth of expertise and uh, just knowledge on board and the level that I wanted the comic to ideally reach. I wanted it to be, you know, not uh, oversimplified to the point of being asinine, but uh, definitely dense enough for people to kind of get their teeth into and uh, approach this subject through the eyes of somebody like me who has no real aptitude for science. It's not a, a thing that I have practiced very much. So it was a good experience in that way. Well, that's a perfect segue for uh, an, another question we have on the list, which is actually like, how did the science inform your art? Um, was there a process that you had sort of planned out to go from that? Was it on the fly? And then how did it sort of manifest what you were learning into, you know, visual? Yeah, so, so I had a, a fairly um, loose notion of what was going to happen before I came aboard. I mean, I, I wrote a proposal saying, hey, I would like to make a comic about the science that's going to be done on the ship. And they provide, Schmidt provides artists uh, in residence folks with a brief of the science that is going to be done on their transit or on their cruise. So it's good to prepare. But of course, the language that a chief scientist might write their proposal in for a research grant or for applying to Schmidt may not necessarily be terms that you, an artist with no scientific background, can understand. So I spent some time when I first got the briefs puzzling over them and being like, what? Okay, they're going to sonar. Uh, mm. Like, I just couldn't necessarily wrap my head around it. So I, I felt that over time, uh, I definitely, with it a lot, lot more once I was in the science party. But the challenge of our particular cruise was that it was a, a science, an opportunistic science cruise where the vessel had to go from Guam to Honolulu. And there was an opportunity for the science team to do some mapping on the way. But the mapping we were doing didn't actually take place until the latter third of the trip. So we spent, you know, two weeks transiting and then like five days of really intense mapping and then a couple more days and we were in Honolulu and the comic had to be done. So there wasn't as much opportunity as I would have liked to take results from our findings and turn those into content in the comic. But that now when I tour to classrooms and I bring the, the comic to students, I can intersperse, you know, here's the comic that introduces the science that we did and the science team with the actual 
with from the mapping, which to me is like the coolest thing as a visual thinker. I'm really, really fortunate that I got put on a cruise with such a visual component. I think it really grabbed my imagination and is, you can see on the cover of the comic, there's kind of an approximation of how mapping looks. You've got these like rainbow um, bathymetry readings, but I think it's nicer to let the figures speak for themselves. So it's that sweet spot between like using illustration to simplify concepts perhaps, or like introduce characters. I think so much of the time, the challenge with science, especially like big, deep geologic, like earth stuff is giving it a human angle, like giving it a lens to, to become more approachable. And all just such a batch of characters. Like I could not have asked for a better ship full of human beings who were really unique and funny and intelligent and charming. And like, it was great to be able to take those characteristics and translate them into. So I think that's probably where I skewed more. That's possibly my own bias too, because I like people. Um, but it was nice to use the people to translate the science. Well, it sounds like you also maybe therefore uh, have left room open for a sequel that you can, yes, uh, you yes, can, take, actually, that, can take the, the series. I'm pitching to Marvel into... and DC right now. <laughs> exactly. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it is. I mean, I think it's something that is nice because at the end of the comic, like the last page gives the URL where you can go onto the Schmidt website and you can see all the data um, that was collected. So there's a little URL there. And my, I think Schmidt does a really good job with uh, outreach and um, and like making sure that the website is really well maintained with blog posts written by all the crew members and follow up data after the cruises have ended and contextual information about the vessel. And I think every uh, research organization has that at their disposal. Like many places do not have the budget to develop a robust or well-functioning internet presence. So it's a huge boon for students, especially in the 21st century to be able to access that resource and I'm glad that the comic can kind of segue into the sequel of hey go on the website because when you go on the website there's always a new cruise going on so you're going to find out something else the minute you show up there. I think a lot of uh, what you're talking about as well with the, the website presence is something you touched on earlier which is making science and stories visual um, having some sort of component that isn't completely dependent on text but also isn't just a visual echo of the text it actually adds something to the experience? I mean, is that, does that yeah. ring a bell? Okay. I definitely agree with that. Yeah, because it's cool. Like you can see figures and figures are neat sometimes. And certainly in the talks that the science party gave. So not only are we like learning to stand watch on the vessel and participate in the mapping, which basically just means like keeping tabs on various instruments and making sure that nothing explodes. Um, if something explodes, you go get the lead marine technician and you hope that it's not your fault. Otherwise she will cut your thumbs off. Uh, and I, <sighs> Oh, I lost my train of thought because I started thinking about losing my thumbs for <laughs> being responsible for an accident. Um, yes, visual interpretations. Uh, the individual members of the science party gave, in addition to training, there were also these just like general interest lectures that the crew attended, that you know the kitchen staff attended, like everybody would pile in to learn about the geology of the Mariana back arc, or, you know, like there's all this other stuff. Um, so, I enjoyed getting to see figures, like scientific figures contextualized in a way that blew my mind, but you needed a little bit of extra context to put that in place. You know, you can see a huge, impressive three-dimensional map of an underground atoll, but it takes somebody explaining to you like how that seamount was formed to be uh, truly meltingly exciting. And, and enthusiasm is communicative too, like that's a, it's a, it's a communicable disease, that's what I always say. And I think that's really important. And I had some very interesting conversations with members of the science party about scientific writing is designed to be as objective as possible, which generally means it is characterless. Uh, you know, that that is like stripped out of students writing when they are in school because the goal is to not distract with linguistic fripperies. You just need to get the data across as efficiently as possible. And I understand the rationale behind that. And also I think it is deadly for <laughs> engaging students because so many of these scientists are raging nerds who are super excited about the stuff that they're working on. And like, what a shame to not be able to express that character or express that passion. 
Um, so either the solution is just put more scientists in rooms with students or hire more cartoonists to make comics about your scientists. I, I know what my vote is on that one. Um, one of the, one of the <laughs> with, with the, some of the examples you're talking about in the process, um, it reminds me a lot of, uh, I'm not sure if we actually mentioned this, but during these expeditions, we put, you mentioned the website, we put uh, updated daily blogs and they're often written by not only a, uh, a multimedia correspondent that we have on board whose job is specifically to to tell to document the journey but we also have guests um the scientists or other crew members or cartoonists whoever's on board can write these blogs and a lot of what jonathan tree wrote about um i personally found really engaging because he did he presented the story of rocks that was actually really interesting and so when you're when you're the way you're speaking i don't know if you guys were just on the same level or if some of his enthusiasm and strategy kind of rubbed off on you. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I definitely, he was the one that I spoke with most often about uh, that process because he was a little earlier in his career. And so it was obviously still going through this like peer reviewing paper uh, dissertation type stuff. And yeah, I don't, I don't want to see generations of people have that passion like torn out of them. <laughs> and also teaching is not everybody's bag. I fully understand that. But I have to say that like going and doing classroom visits around this comic, even though we only like just got the print editions, um, I got to do a couple school visits while I was in Honolulu after we arrived from our transit and being able to present even just photographs of the pages that I'd finished and shots from the trip to these students was such a obviously really captured their imaginations. So if the scientists don't want to do it, like, I'll go do it, that's fine. But it, it feels really, I, I think I was very struck by how uh, the response to the comics that I've done about historical maritime stuff, that everybody wants to talk about scurvy all the time, of course, why not? But there is something very different about engaging with science that has a current impact on uh, environmental policy, you know, the political, like, national, power grabs for various types of um, land. There was just a big brouhaha about the reevaluation of the um, Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument, uh, which was the area that we were mapping in. And it was the first time that I felt like I could comment with any degree of involvement or certainty on a <laughs> political action of that sort, because it was like, hey, buddy, I've been there and it was important and here's why. And I just did a whole comic about it. You can read it on the internet uh, and definitely please preserve this region because it was important uh, and amazing to go there and interesting to hear from all these people who have been studying it for so long. Anyway, uh, but yeah, science. Science is hot topic right now. Uh, <laughs> turns out far more relevant than things that happened many hundreds of years ago. So I'm gonna keep doing both, but it, it was fun to do something that was a little bit more immediate and relevant. Well, can you actually uh, maybe flip through the comic and uh, show us a yeah. little bit, maybe give us a quick tour, um, some greatest hits and Maybe while you're doing that, talk about um, if it, if you can do two things at once um, or three things at once. Um, talk about sort of what your process is and and uh, and what were your goals in going through and creating the comic. Yeah. So because we were doing this with, so here is like the finished comic, right? There it is, all shiny. It's in color, thanks to my amazing colorist Joey Weiser, um, who we were lucky enough to work with once the comic was finished. So there's a basic kind of introduction to the vessel named after Falcor the Luck Dragon, which is everybody when they open this comic immediately they see the Luck Dragon and they're like, Ah, it's Falcor! <laughs> and I'm like, Yeah, that's the name of the ship. And then they get really excited and they take a copy. Um, I just got back from doing the uh, Festival of Sail Tacoma, so I was up there with a lot of maritime nerds uh, hanging out with a bunch of tall ships, and it was a really good time. So there's introductions to the crew and stuff, and this is all, I mean, it's uh, not a super long comic, but it's dense, right? There's a lot of information being crammed in here, and I tried not to summarize too much of what is already on the Schmidt website, because there's a lot of, like, data and things. Um, but the color just adds so much, it's just so much nicer. Especially when I realized that um, we had to do this bathymetry stuff of like, how do you convey what multi-beam sonar looks like in black and white? Like it just couldn't, it's, it's all about color. Um, so that was really helpful. But as far as the actual process for making the book went, I followed a more traditional route for this because it had to be vetted by a team of people, uh, right? Every, every step of the way we were running this through various folks and channels and saying like, okay, is this factually correct? Does this reflect the aims of the science party? Does it reflect the aims of the organization? So I wrote a script probably sometime after I'd been 
it was, I, I would say a week into the cruise, maybe five days when I kind of got my sea legs and stopped vomiting all over everything and figured out like what was going on. I definitely get seasick. Uh, that's the thing that everyone's always like, oh, Lucy, but you're, you, you're in love with the sea. You love sailing. Sailing is the best. I'm like, yes, it is. I also get seasick, but that's how much I love the sea is that I go anyway. Um, I've always been told that there are two types of sailors. One, people who haven't gotten seasick and those that uh, are <laughs> those yeah, it's who, like, haven't, I, who I have been seasick and those who haven't been yet. <laughs> have not been seasick, those who will be seasick, and those who are lying. Oh, uh, oh nice. Even better. I like that one a lot better. Nice. Nice. Because there are always people who are like, ah, it doesn't bother me. And it, it's never like, it's never when you expect. It might not be when the ocean is like rough and wild and rowdy. It may just be one day when you're in like a very, very slight roll and suddenly, whoop. Anyway, it gives you very healthy, uh, a very, very healthy attitude towards vomiting. Um, so that's the takeaway from this. <laughs> anyway, uh, so yeah, after I got kind of a sense of the way things were going on the ship and the kinds of stuff that I might cover, uh, I worked out a draft of a script and put that together and then started doing um, thumbnails and roughs. And I drew the comics pages all by hand. I considered bringing a tablet and doing it digitally, but um, it definitely that I worked traditionally for the trip. It was a lot of fun. I'm a big stickler for traditional stuff, so it uh, was was a good time. Uh, the original pages are all about, uh, I want to say like 14 by 17, I think, 14 by 19. They're fairly big. Um, so that's why when they're shrunk down like this, they look so crisp, like the artwork looks all nice and tidy. Um, and the lettering was all ruled out uh, old school with an Ames lettering guide, which is an old drafting tool that gets used by um, architects, I mean, used to get used by architects. They all use computers now too. And I inked, well, let's see. Okay, so this penciling is like the big layout stage where you get all the shapes figured out and everything goes onto the page. And then uh, I had to go about inking the comic. And obviously in the ocean, there are trade winds, there are waves, it's moving uh, quite a bit. And people who saw the original artwork and who have seen the comic are like, wait, but you drew this and it's not all wobbly. And I think that is perhaps the greatest skill that I have come away from my time at Schmidt with is being able to draw in a moving seaway. And there was just a lot of like very carefully timing lengthy brush strokes of being like, okay, the ship is gonna roll to starboard. So I'm gonna like start the brush stroke now and then just follow it around and try to use the motion of the ship. And actually one of the previous uh, artists at sea Oh gosh, I'm gonna forget who it was. It Michelle who did this one, the the piece where she like had an artist's book with the pen hanging from a pendulum. So there was a, a neat um, similar concept with a very different outcome of suspending a pen over a sheet of paper and then allowing the organic motion of the vessel to dictate where the pen moved, which resulted in an artist book that had these like really weird, unique squiggly lines based on the movement of the vessel. So this is kind of the opposite. This was like trying to force iron clarity from a very variable environment. Uh, I have a, a big, I, I guess the thing that's emerging in my work is that I have a very clean line style, lean clair as it's called, which is what people usually associate with like Hergé and Tintin. And uh, it could have been a much easier process if I were not adherent to that. But uh, I think it came out really, this is possibly the cleanest comic I have ever made. So I, I'm impressed that maybe the overcompensation of trying to do it in a moving seaway really helped. But yeah, the, the stressor was that the comic had to be done by the time we landed in Honolulu. So this was kind of a three week start to finish process because uh, there was a gallery show right when we arrived. So the ship got in and we, I think we arrived at like six in the morning. Then that afternoon, I'm pretty sure I was in the gallery hanging it. And then like the following night, the show was up and the thing opened. And then I said goodbye to my originals and off they went into the world. And now they've been to, I think they're at the America's Cup in Bermuda right now. That's great. Uh, and they were in Monterey for a while with a bunch of other artists at sea stuff. So that's super cool. Uh, but yeah, it's, it, this is pretty, this is pretty standard, I guess, as, as far as comics processes go. Well, one of the things you also uh, mentioned, you actually have your sketchbook with you now. Um, you mentioned that there were some, you know, some, again, sort of working concepts and I don't know if you would say trial runs, but... Uh, yeah, I didn't do that. a lot of trial runs for the actual comic, but I definitely was drawing the whole time that I was there. So like you can see, I was doing a lot of sketches of members of the crew. Um, and I was trying, there was definitely like some comics about the benefits of using non-slip shelf liner. Uh, which is one of those things that we put in drawers to stop utensils moving around, but artists also use them on slanted drawing tables and sailors use them on every available surface because everything is a slanted surface 
on a ship. Um, and there's the one of the hydraulic ones I've got there. I kind of tried to take a view every day and just like sit in a different part of the vessel and draw stuff. People were really curious about the sleeping quarters, so I did some sketches indoors. There's the view from the monkey deck. Um, the really spiffy library. I've definitely said to everybody that staying on Falkor was kind of like three weeks in the nicest hotel I've ever stayed in. It was very fancy. I mean, maybe not the nicest hotel, but like it's, you know, it's it, it was very well apportioned for a vessel. I'm used to sleeping in a bunk that's like minuscule and, you know, everything is wood and uh, old and kind of damp. And this was very uh, fancy and air conditioned, which was a huge boon because paper in the humidity is just a, it's a bad scene. Um, but yeah, I, I was drawing a fair bit when we first got there, and it it's always a really nice way to connect with a community of people because everyone is curious about like what you've been drawing and what you're going to show folks, and uh, it was a good way to connect with people online because we had full internet connectivity the whole time we were at sea, so it was helpful to be able to um, share that stuff out with the world and uh, tweet out, you know, photos and things and say, oh, here's a drawing of this thing today. Here's a drawing of that thing today. And it was really something to be able to share the journey with people in real time. Uh, I don't know that I would have had that. And I think it, even though we were down one of our satellite antenna, which uh, we were told might affect the, apparently the internet on this cruise was particularly stellar compared to like any other cruise that uh, I know Monica or multimedia liaison said that she was just astonished at how good the Wi-Fi had been. So I was very, very grateful for <laughs> whatever Wi-Fi gods provided that because it was helpful to be able to share that. Nice. Yeah, part of the, um, uh, with the regards to the internet and to um, what you had mentioned earlier about uh, having a comfortable, a comfortable place to live and work, um, it is yeah. so difficult to get out at sea and it is so expensive and so time consuming that one of the goals of Falcor is to free the scientists up to do as much work as possible. Um, and as you know from your other, <laughs> other uh, uh, shipboard experiences, one of the best ways to keep people content and happy is good food and be yes. well rested and things like that. And so it's kind of counterproductive yeah. if you're sending people out on a once in a lifetime opportunity that can be you know, amazingly helpful knowledge if you skimp on some of what might seem as a, a basic, but needs to really be taken care of. Because if people aren't operating optimally, then you're you're maybe spinning some wheels. You know, you're not performing as well or taking advantage of the situation as much as you can. Um, oh, that's yeah, a definitely. bit of a segue, but uh, along those lines, like, um, did what what sort of were your opinions? What what were you sort of um, told about? Uh, how mapping this area was helpful for scientists. Um, the Johnston Atoll is considered a pretty important stepping stone for the Pacific, and you mentioned that earlier in, in some of the, the, the political aspects. What did the scientists, did they share anything with you about how what they were doing was helpful overall? So the things that really stuck out to me were that this is a region that hasn't been mapped in detail. I mean, the actual Johnston Atoll proper has, but these uh, surrounding sea mounts, there are so many areas at the bottom of the ocean that we just have not examined in great detail. And uh, having seen the, the process that everybody went through to gather this data, I can understand why, because it's a heck of a lot of work and resources to like track a vessel back and forth like a lawnmower over a region. And of course you think it's going to be like a lawnmower and then it ends up being like some sort of psychedelic snail because you know, there's just, you got to adjust on the fly and the current's doing this and you've got to do that. And like, it was very uh, magical to watch the crew and the science party kind of communicate with one another about actually supposed to be doing, especially after being told for two weeks, oh yeah, it's going to be like a lawnmower, we're just going to go back and forth, and then coming down to watch the first morning, and already right off the bat, we were like, and you know, we were getting full coverage, but it was definitely not what we had anticipated. Um, so you have to be flexible at sea. Uh, yeah, so they're understanding the uh, composition of the ground down there, like the, the sea floor and what kinds of um, minerals might lie in those regions and whether that would make them a target for mining in the future for people who are looking for particular rare earth minerals for electronic use or what have you. Uh, and then also just getting, I think the, the biggest point, I guess, was getting a snapshot of what that region is like. And that's maybe more of a Sebastian like ROV type mission to be able to look at actual organisms. This was more topography um, or bathymetry, I guess, not topography, it's for tall things, mountains. Um, but yeah, getting the bathymetry of the region is really helpful because, you know, if we end up 
areas where like they fall prey to mining efforts or you know ocean acidification or like all this stuff that can happen it, so much has changed already and even just having a snapshot of what things were like now in 2017 moving forward can change so much and just give us a piece of information to work so it's felt like a lot of what we were doing was was just establishing some kind of baseline but also trying to figure out the ages and the formation of these various seamounts like where they had where they had initially come from like when did they show up and it's, it's i'm reading um bill bryson's a brief history of nearly everything right now um definitely like expanding my brain in terms of all of these moments in science where people have been trying to figure out both the stuff that we now know to be true and then the vast quantity of stuff that we do not know to be true and i just got to the bit about discovering plate tectonics and uh, the fact that the seafloor is comparatively quite young because it's constantly being subducted and like refreshed and renewed. So it was cool to get a sense of the geologic time scale at play. But it's, I, I think a point that I took away is that it is often a very hard sell, especially right now when climate change is a super hot button issue, obviously. Uh, and there's a lot of money available for research into that kind of stuff, but then Geology is like the slowest, vastest, uh, least dynamic, or perhaps most most and least dynamic science. Uh, and a couple of the scientists that I was talking to were saying like it could be a hard sell for funding, just slow moving, and you can discover really fascinating stuff. But I think there's a certain element of like so what, or like what's the immediate helpful takeaway. I, I understand that there is a paucity of resources and also it's just like I, I wish that I'd be able to pursue all of or all of that research irrespective of its immediate utility right now because it's great for us to know what's out there. We can't protect it if we don't know what it looks like or you know what's going on down there. And there was something really heady about the notion that we were examining in detail a portion of the seafloor that nobody had ever examined in detail before that just like hadn't been done. It was really cool. Well, a, a little bit along those lines, uh, one of the things that I've noticed in some of your other work, it, it, door, it, it deals also with history. And one of the things mm -hmm. that I think is kind of maybe a little tangential in this is that history obviously can't be seen now. And as you were talking about a lot of the features and a lot of the, uh, the aspects that you were studying, although they are concrete, they're not, tan you know, um, they're not intangible, but they're not things that can be seen. And so I'm kind of wondering how, since you are primarily, you're, since you're primarily a visual artist, but also a storytelling artist, has getting into this science-based, uh, I don't want to say storytelling, but science-based narratives or documentation, yeah. like how, do, how has that affected your artwork? Has it, has it changed it or has it simply made you flex those muscles more? Does that sort of make sense? It, it did challenge me to draw some stuff that was, uh, outside of my comfort zone or like definitely not something that I would opt to draw. Although I say that as somebody who regularly gets chastised for drawing tall ships, which are incredibly complicated and full of rigging and lines and things. And I definitely question my sanity sometimes when I am optionally drawing that stuff, but I don't draw as much modern technological equipment. So that was definitely a challenge, but I think it was valuable to remind myself that I, drawing is a skill that you can apply, you know, good observational drawing where you can just take like a thing from life and then render it on paper is kind of a superpower and that you can translate anything around you to the page. And it's, you know, it's an instinct, you hone it over time, what to take out and what to leave in. Um, but I feel like I'm starting to hit a happy medium in my work of giving enough detail. Like I, I didn't, I did not want to skew too far into drawing instructional manuals. That's something that I would really never like to do. And I know there's, there is a market for that in comics right now. I have a friend who's working on a book and heaven praise him because like, that's a very worthy and useful thing. Uh, I'm, I'm stoked on seeing it out in the world, but it's also just not what I would want to do because I don't want anybody reliant on my drawings for like life-saving mechanical advice. <laughs> uh, however, that being said, like working on this, I got to realize that a lot of the stuff that I drew was you know accurate enough that people could get a sense of what things were like on the ship and it broadened my horizons for the possibilities of what i could be doing with my work and where i could be best applying myself to help make a difference not just in making comics that are important to me which i think is good but i think it's also vital to remember as an artist that 
personal work and like activist work, you know, and you can have the stuff that is self-indulgent and maybe also like touches other people and is valuable to them. I'm working on a project right now that's like very self-centered, um, but is also very resonant in its in its personalness. And so there's that kind of extreme. And then I feel like there's something like this, which has relatively little of me in it beyond being a kind of talk show host of like, let's talk to these people. What's going on over here? Um, but you can use your uh, graphic ability, of your writing ability, of your like, you know, multimedia savvy, whoever you are, whatever you do, to interpret for an audience of people who are maybe not in touch with the primary science. So I've I've been thinking more about that. I think like that's what I came away with is considering the ways in which we can use our creative tools to broaden public understanding of this stuff. And it's something. It's one of the reasons I love working with the Nib is that I think the work they do is really valuable for capturing complicated social issues in easily distilled graphic formats. And, you know, comics journalism as a field is really taking off right now because we're living in this increasingly visual society and people are primarily ingesting information, especially over the internet through images. So like, what if we could, you know, step into that and try to make bold, beautiful, approachable work that invites people to learn more about this stuff and change the way that they think about it. Nice. Yeah, totally. Um, along the uh, sort of along the lines with that is, although it maybe wasn't something that you totally planned on doing, like, would you be interested in doing more science based things? And uh, I know you don't want to write instruction manuals, but more, more informational, again, sort of translation of like you said, some of the scientists have a whole lot of passion, but the means that it's communicated by is often pretty dry. Like, would this be something that you see informing your work as you move forward or you looking for other opportunities to discuss science and, and push that along? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the huge uh, shift that happened during this trip was that it was sort of, I don't want to say the nail in the coffin. What's all of these sayings, like the straw that broke the camel's back, like all of these are negative. I'm trying How to think about of a one that's like... It, it connects the it pin, it Yeah, the, in being able to uh, fully inhabit this adventure cartoonist label because it, it's, I had called myself a combination of those words before. It said like, oh, I'm a cartoonist who goes on adventures. I'm a tall ship sailing cartoonist. I'm a whatever. And nothing quite captured it. And this trip was different enough than stuff I had done before, but I'm also not exclusively ocean going. Like I've done comics about whitewater rafting in the Grand Canyon or, you know, there's like a, there's a variety there. So I was trying to hit on something that would encompass the fact that I was getting to go to Guam, which like felt like a very legitimacy of this experience that allowed me to pivot into calling myself an adventure cartoonist and really meaning it. And I think there's something of the self-fulfilling prophecy about that, where like once you start, then other people, it, it was, and it was very noticeable when that shift happened because that's a job that if you tell somebody you're an adventure cartoonist, they're like, I don't know what that is, but I want to be one yesterday. Like, where do I sign up? Take me, take me with you. Uh, so it's, it's gotten me thinking about, okay, well, if this is my, like, how can I uh, leverage that into other opportunities? And it absolutely has me thinking about other residencies. You know, I've looked at other stuff. I, I've been trying to put the brakes on this year because it's really just been like two years of nonstop and I need a bit of a break to be able to regroup and produce some new work at home because it's hard to make stuff and be on the road. And I think one of the things that really draws me to doing stuff like this is that it's often, even though we had internet on the vessel, like being in the middle of the Pacific with no land around for hundreds of thousands of miles is like very helpful for focusing. Uh, so it was good to spend time in a concentrated work environment. I think the thing that I struggle with, especially as a small business owner is having too many plates spinning at once and I get a lot done, but I get it done in 15 different channels and I don't that deep focus. So this trip was a huge gift for me in being able to just dive deep into something, power through it, research it, learn about it, draw it, get it out, have it published. And that was just all in like that three week period. And then we had a little longer to do the coloring and the printing and all the rest of it. But like the start to finish on the comic was fairly intense. And that's been the case for all the other, as well where I'm like drawing in the field at the bottom of the Grand Canyon with a sketchbook just like well, getting it done and that is just the best like I love working that way because it means that all the distraction falls by the wayside so it's it's something that I've started looking into and I feel like the the greater the body of work I can build around it and Schmidt is a great 
legitimizing factor in that. I think if it's a trip that I've taken on my own, I can pitch an organization and say, hey, you could take me with you and I could do this thing. But saying that I've partnered with uh, an organization like Schmidt that has a strong profile in the industry, I think is useful for future, not just oceanographic trips, but like uh, experiences in other areas. And so I'm, I'm hoping to spend some time in the future tagging along with other kinds of expeditions to figure out more about that stuff. Nice, nice. And uh, I, you used the word best earlier, and that sort of is, is one, of the, one of the fun questions about this. Do you have a memory that you would consider the best or one of the best things that happened on the ship or something that really stands out that was uh, a, great, a great part of it? I would say uh, there are lots of them. Um, there was a night where, so I, I loved, I posted many, many videos, uh, and photos of just the way the light on the water was changing on the day to day. I mean, like the science was cool and all of that, but I, I am genuinely just so in love with the sea that one of the greatest gifts was being able to spend three weeks and just every morning rushing up from below and being able to take stock of, you know, what was going on with the sunrise and how the light was hitting the waves and the quality of the wind. And it was so warm and balmy and magical the whole time we were out there. But there was one night where uh, it was a full moon and I scrambled up onto the monkey deck, which is the sort of top observation deck. Um, and was just sitting looking forward in the vessels, you know, plowing ahead and the moon was just directly in front of us, like sinking into the sea. And at night, the um, brown footed boobies would come and kind of swoop around the vessel and wait to land on our meteorological antenna uh, to <laughs> screw up everybody's readings. Um, and it was great trying to watch them land in a high wind, you know, because they'd be like cruising along and then like trying to come in for the landing and then fletching it and doing all a lot of this and then peeling off and coming back around and trying it again. And then of course another one would want to come and join the first one and so they'd argue about it for a while. Um, so I was sitting up there watching the birds and one of them came and landed right on the railing. And you know, we were about three feet apart and so I my head next to it and just sat there like two feet away from this magnificent bird and got to examine its plumage and like look at the moon and look at the water and just to hang out with this awesome bird for a while and then uh, I think the bird took off and I went to bed and that was the end of it. But it, it was just a really lovely peaceful moment. Getting to observe the, the wildlife that we did see. I think I saw one flying fish and it was the first I had seen for days outside of the people on the vessel and I just remember letting this inadvertent shriek of joy out and it's really interesting how much you take seeing wildlife around you for granted like the ocean is full of organisms but they are all below the surface so we don't really spend a lot of time getting to see them and as we got closer to the atoll there were a lot more birds but it, for the first couple of weeks it was sparse um so getting getting those brief opportunities to watch wildlife was a really big thrill for me that's really interesting it's a really good point i mean i think that's a, uh, something that a lot of people don't necessarily consider or haven't, you know, had, haven't had the opportunity to experience that it is an incredibly diverse biological and active biological, but sometimes we just don't see it. You know, we're not, we're not, no. we're not there to see that. Um, yeah. It's why having the, the ROV is so fantastic is that you can, you know, stream live to YouTube and be like, look, this is, I was just looking up um, giant tube worms with my housemate the other night. Cause that's what we do for fun. And we were looking at an Okeanos Explorer video uh, of these like various giant tube worms. And how cool is that to be able to go down to the Mariana trench with your little ROV and like stream to the, it's just the future is really cool. <laughs> well, along those lines, was there anything about the science uh, that you saw that was sort of unexpected or that really reaffirmed anything for you? Mm, um, boy. This is, this is the part where it being six months after the cruise is probably a bit of a challenge uh, to <laughs> wrap my head around stuff that was happening back then. I just keep thinking about the translating uh, the various streams of data that were coming in into something that was visually comprehensible and both seeing my own understanding of the data that was being gathered growing over the course of the three weeks and then also seeing how the science team chose to take that data and translate it into something that was visually comprehensive. So I'm thinking about in the slideshow presentation that I usually give to schools, there's a comparison of two, there's the, um, the one of the seamounts that we examined that's got a really cool um, like avalanche crater on one side of it. And so that's the thing that looks kind of rainbow, right? Your usual um, map situation. But then 
they also take the backscatter data, which is like additional information that comes back from the multi-beam sonar that's being used to gather all of this information and overlay it on the map in such a way that mimics the the composition of like soil or not soil, but um, you know, rock and uh, minerals. And that was really cool because the the backscatter was something that oh, you can see in the backscatter here as the data is coming in, and I would just stare and stare at this like weird fan-shaped wedge of static and be like, I don't see it. I don't know what it is. And over time, occasionally, I could see variations in the backscatter, but seeing the backscatter overlaid on the map was like, oh my god, this is amazing. Uh, and it really, especially after spending many, many hours of watch just like staring at this screen, waiting for the data to come in and not really parsing what was going on in there. Um, so that's that's the stuff that I really like captured my imagination the most. I'm sure there was other stuff, but I'm probably forgetting it. No, that's really great. <laughs> that, that's an awesome example. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm a visual person, so like the visual <laughs> stuff really stood out to me. Maybe I should look at the comic. Did I cheat and put anything in here that would perhaps help me? Now I know what an atoll is. I know how atolls are formed. That was really exciting. Useful. Yeah, it was. Oh, and I mean, I guess the the coolest thing for me was that this information literally goes back into the world and like gets incorporated into Google Earth. So people can now, presumably, whenever they finish vetting the data and it goes up into the database. Um, increases the resolution of that one particular part of the Pacific. A, I hadn't spent a lot of time in Google Earth in the middle of the Pacific before for any particular reason. But what was cool now is that like we familiarized ourselves with all the bathymetry of the area. And so I can go onto Google Maps and I can like zoom into this particular area and I can find those three seamounts that we mapped because I spent so much time looking at them. And they're also like the only high res thing in the region. So it's it's neat to see the comparison feels like an Easter egg to see the tracks of multi-beam vessels traversing the Pacific and then also the regions where they've gone back and forth and actually gotten more data. That's awesome. That's really cool. Well, this has been a really wonderful conversation. Is there anything you'd like? Sorry, I muted out there. Um, the there thing that I'm most excited here? about most excited about is having uh, copies of these comics that I get to give away to people. So if you're watching and you're an educator, uh, feel free to drop me an email. It is, uh, you can find me at Lucy PC, like the computer PC, bellwood at gmail.com uh, or my website, lucybellwood.com. And there's information there about how to get copies from me. I would love to ship your classroom slash discussion group slash science groupies organization a bunch of them. <laughs> Uh, so that you can read them and share them and give them away or come find me at a convention. There's a listing on my website of places I will be. But yeah, I'm looking forward to sharing this more widely with the world and seeing where the the art people in the future. It's always fun to hear from folks who have learned a little bit more about the world based on something that I've drawn. Awesome, that's great. And that's a very good point. We, uh, we have links for the comic um, below. Um, that uh, in the the sorry in the description of the YouTube channel below. The place down uh, there. <laughs> exactly, and we uh, Schmidt also distributes the the comics. Um, we will um, pro give them to anyone who's interested. Um, it is uh, part of the 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 process of what Schmidt Ocean does is to make sure that the information that is gathered is given out freely, uh, open source to anyone uh, anywhere. And so uh, that is definitely a big part of this whole process is not just creating something and sitting on it, but making sure that it gets out to people. So there's a lot more information on our website, which is schmidtocean.org. Uh, we will have some links in the video, uh, uh, on the video below that give you uh, direct access to the cartoons, or excuse me, the comics and the, the stories. Um, and I, overall, I just wanna say thank you so much for joining us today. Um, yeah, thank you, Lucy, course. for taking the time to share knowledge and insight. My pleasure. And, uh, it was nice to revisit this stuff. <laughs> so good to have you. Definitely wonderful having this conversation. Cool. Uh, be sure, audience, uh, please do visit schmidtocean.org to find out more about our scientific expeditions and research, as well as our outreach programs, such as Artists at Sea. And we also give ship-to-shore connections uh, to classrooms and to various aquariums and other gatherings of folks. Um, please follow us on social media for updates and more information. We're at Schmidt Ocean uh, on Twitter, Instagram, and on Facebook. Um, thank you very much for your time, and have a great day. Bye, guys. Bye.